Hello fellow time travelers, Tony Whit here. I must apologize ahead of time, both to you, our listeners, and to my fellow panelists on this episode for what you are about to hear. Because it was our first four-person panel, and because we were a, a bit pressed for time, I didn't set up our microphones properly, and as a result, Sheena and myself were under and Dalton and Allison were over Because of this, I've had to very carefully reduce or increase volume throughout this recording when needed, but there might be some spots that got away from me, so headphone listeners, please beware. I'm also re-recording some parts, such as the intro and outro, that either did not get recorded in the original session or were simply too difficult to hear, which is why parts of this will be so much better quality than others. I apologize again, and I can only promise to do better next time. I'd like to give a special shout-out to my friend Anthony Placanio for listening to my previous recordings and letting me know whether they were endurable or not. Hopefully this won't hurt his or your ears. Enjoy as best you can, and thank you for listening. Hello fellow time travelers, and welcome back to the Doctor Who Target Book Club, the podcast in which we undertake the titanic task of discussing in story order all of the Doctor Who novelizations. My name is Tony Whit, and today we have a titanic four-person discussion panel, including our so-called expert who's been a Who fan since 1979, that would be me. There's also our intermediate-level casual fan who has seen several episodes but has not previously read any of the books until these podcasts, and this time it's none other than Dalton Hughes. Hello, Dalton. Hello again, hello. And finally, we have not one, but two novice fans, one who has seen little to none of the original series and has not previously read any of the books, and this time around it's the wise and wonderful Alison Fitch Safried. Hello, Alison. Hello, Tony. And finally, we bring back one who has seen little to none of the original series, but has so far read all of the books with us. And this time it's the always lovely Sheena Anna Para. Hello, Sheena. Hello. This month we're getting double the dicks. Terrence dicks, that is. <laughs> Since both of the novels we're reading this month are written by the most prolific of Doctor Who novelizers. In this episode, we're discussing the novelization of the 10th Doctor Who story, The Dalek Invasion of Earth which is also the first Hartnell story novelization that Dix ever did, except for one possible exception, which we'll talk about soon. Without further ado, here are some fast facts. Doctor Who and the Dalek Invasion of Earth, adapted by Terrence Dix from the script by Terry Nation that aired from 112164 to 122664, published by Target Books in 1977. As of this recording in May of 2017, this title is currently out of print. It is available as a BBC audio book, 142 pages. As we said last time, Planet of Giants is Dick's last Cardinal novelization and his next to last Target book ever. In fact, he would do only one after that, and that's Troughton's story, which we won't be getting to for quite a while. While Dalek Invasion of Earth is his first Cardinal novelization from 1977. And it's not even the first Cardinal book done under the Target imprint apart from the three from the 60s, though. That honor goes to the Tenth Planet, which was Hartnell's last story, I know it gets really confusing, and it was published the year before this one, and I think that's because it's the Cyberman's first appearance, so they wanted to really sell that. The only time Dix had written anything with the first Doctor in it was in 1975, when he novelized the 10th anniversary story of the Three Doctors, and you get a little bit of the first Doctor in that, even though it's not really a first Doctor story, uh, to be honest. This is also one of the first books in which we'll see Dix significantly changing things or adding back in so that the story is enhanced. At the beginning of chapter 8, for instance, when the Doctor dismantles a Dalek bomb, I'm sure most of you got to chapter 8. I found out before recording tonight that some people had <laughs> not done the whole book. I was well past that. Uh-huh. Made it well past chapter 8. Well, that's, that's good. the good people. Well, that's good to know. Yes, of course you are. <laughs> of course you are. 
then he provides a drink. So <laughs> but at the beginning of chapter 8, the doctor dismantles a Dalek bomb. In the real world, in the televised version, it's not Hartnell, it's not the doctor doing it, it's actually um, David Campbell who does it. Because Hartnell got hurt during the filming of the rescue from the saucer and had to take a week off. Here, Dix is obviously working from the scripts, because that's how it was originally scripted. So it's the Doctor who does the heroic stuff, and it's quite the improvement. Let's read the blurb, shall we? To summarize the story, since no one has ever heard of it, only two of us actually know the full story. The oh, zing! <laughs> the TARDIS lands in a London of future times. A city of fear, devastation, and holocaust. A city now ruled by Daleks in bold mm -hmm. caps. The Doctor and his companions meet a team of underground resistance workers among the few survivors, but after an unsuccessful attack on the Dalek spaceship, they are all forced to flee the capital. A perilous journey through England finally brings them to the secret center of Dalek operations and the mysterious reason for the Dalek invasion of Earth. Yeah, it's... Yeah. The mysterious reason. The mysterious reason, exactly. You notice something about this cover, and I don't know if I've, uh, if, let me pass it around. The Dalek ship on the cover, and I also brought the German novelization um, to the recording, it's the same cover. And the Dalek <coughs> ship on the cover in the Roboman is more reminiscent of the movie that was made from the serial, uh, Dalek Invasion of 2150 AD, the one with, uh, with, uh, what's his name? Peter Cushing. Mm -hmm. Actually, Allison, you and I watched that. Which I have seen several years ago. So was there an episode and a movie remaking the same story? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the first two movies in the, uh, the 1960s, uh, 1965 and 66, did the first two Dalek stories. In fact, they were going to do the third one, but <laughs> they ran out of money, and the third one is just awful. <laughs> that shows wisely. It's got the guys. Yeah. Yeah, it does, and it actually features the Doctor, which is unusual in and of itself. Right. And I guess they figured... That the, oh, yeah, that's right. The guy. Igor and Richard and Bogdanov, yeah. Um, if you look, in fact, Allison doesn't know about this, but... Oh, that's um, amazing here. I don't think Dalton does either, but... It's like the Menendez the brothers. Well, they kind of are. <laughs> the Bogdanov brothers were famed in France for being fans of science fiction and for being physicists, and then mm -hmm. later they became famous for pulling a huge fraud with their physics papers by writing all this junk that even physicists said wasn't actual physics. And then they became aficionados of plastic surgery, so they became famous for just how misshapen and dough-like their faces look now. They're the very Hans and Franz looking. They're, yes. <laughs> they're terrifying. They're absolutely... They're, they're beautiful and cute. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, they're disgusting and they're terrifying. Like, are they... Yeah, so, exactly. are they just... They're just guys. Are they just... They are they people for people? Doctor Who? No, no. Is this, what's they, the... Uh, they were um, they did a show on French television about science and then about science fiction. So Doctor Who became kind of the thing that they were to okay. sell Doctor Who in France. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was I was confused looking at this. I was like, are these supposed to be? Is this David? Is this no, Tyler? God no. Uh, God no. No. Okay. It would be a little bit like um, what's his name who presents Cosmos now. Um, oh Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson. It would be like Neil deGrasse Tyson introducing some Sacramento. work of Japanese science fiction. And then okay. turning out to be a fraud. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start with Sheena because, one, you weren't here last time, and two, you read the book. So what Sheena is a kiss-up. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So what were your first impressions of this one? I liked it. Um, I like anything that's, like, kind of true to form to what, like, I think that Doctor Who is, sort mm -hmm. of. Like, the Daleks yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I really liked it. I'm not, yeah. like, the last one I was on, I did a history one, and I wasn't super keen on it. Oh, yeah, Reign of Terror. Yeah, yeah. so, um, yeah, I liked it a lot. It was really good. Okay. It was really fast to read for me. Thought it was like super interesting. I mean, there are some things in it with those kind of like, eh, mm. that's kind of like anything, really. Okay, we'll get to those. Allison, how about you? I thought it started quite gripping with the first paragraph about the suicide and the river it was actually very striking. Mm -hmm. And they painted the scene very well, but then I thought after about 30 pages, it just kind of devolved into plot mechanics that were not as 
interesting as the initial world building. Mm. Okay, and Dalton? Yeah, I saw some of that too, where like some of the descriptors, some of the story felt like, oh, okay, this is going in a different direction. But as I started reading and as I got through it, it was it was very much like that adventure-based, episodic kind of Doctor Who that I like and I'm used to. Like it was very much like, all right, okay, this isn't one of those like thinking types. This <laughs> yeah. is a very no. much as this is action oriented. This is oh, there goodness. there are robot men and there are Daleks and there's a lot going on that we don't know about and we're going to explore that. So yeah, um, I'm with Sheena. Like it was very, very much yeah. like a quick read. Once I did start reading it yeah, this it morning. <laughs> <laughs> you always say that. <laughs> Let's see. I, I don't know if Sheena actually got to reading uh, Planet of Giants. If you actually did read it. I read like half of it. You did read Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you read enough to see how Dix does the yeah. gap. Or no. Yeah. I read like almost all of it. I didn't finish it. Okay. That's fine. If there's, you're not missing yeah, I'm missing a lot. But um, did you guys see a difference in the way Dix describes the TARDIS crew this time around compared to the way he did it in Planet of Giants? The Doctor, Ian, Susan, Barbara, did you find it? I mean, I didn't really think in this book that there was, um, there wasn't really a ton of character, I mean, you didn't like, I mean, we already kind of know what the characters look like, you know, and things like that, but he, didn't, he gave more, like, actional <clears throat> you know, what they're doing type things. Like, there was no descriptive things on what people really, like, other than the mask that the guys wore that were, like, the cyborgs and things like that. Like, it, there, but nothing was really that descriptive. Okay. I know there was a couple things in there, like the the Black Dalek and that they're, that they look different than before on the other planet, which was right. kind of a cool thing oh, yeah. that they said. Um, but yeah, it, well, nothing was really, them. nothing was descriptive about the people that we've seen in every story, to me, that was mm. any different than anything else. Nothing stood out. Yeah, but he did describe other things, and that was, you know, interesting, because those are the things, like, you need to describe, because you've never, like, read them before, you right. know, other than in the past. Yeah, exactly, and, and Dix, as we've said before, is very much described as a very script to page kind of author yeah so if it's on screen you're going to see it on the page except in this case where he actually put stuff back in which is pretty awesome i thought that ian was significantly less buffoonish in this one than the last oh, one Oh yeah yeah you actually and, got to see ian do ian and his his frustrations were almost all shown to be justified <laughs> the yeah. doctor is quite dickish throughout <laughs> which yeah, it was in the right. previous book but the the previous one you know, kind of portrayed Ian as being, well, if we're talking about, you know, popular science educators, sort of Bill Nye on a bad day. <laughs> and he was, he was... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got a tagline well, on this episode. But previously, like, the doctor's <laughs> condescension was more justified, and this time you feel more Ian's uh, just gr growing, mounting frustration and rage at being treated in this way. You <laughs> can see that. Yeah. Um, just... Just going back to the the part where he's describing the the crew, as it were, and he he's talking about Barbara and Ian. He says, uh, once though it seemed a very long time ago, they had both been school teachers. So he kind of he kind of like is describing that even though they haven't been in this situation very long, these few adventures they've been on have really like taken a toll on them in a way oh, yeah. and made them really like. They've changed them for sure. Yeah, like world weary in a way. It's like, okay, well, you, I mean, you have been through a lot and you have almost died multiple times. So, <laughs> what's a few you near know, deaths <laughs> between friends? Right? I mean, why not? But um, yeah, I thought that was like an interesting little take. It's like, okay, well, mm -hmm. instead of the typical like, here are the adventurers. Here's a little backstory. Here's how they ended up together. That one was more like, all right, well, yeah, like they've been together, they've been through this, but now it's like. This is the core group right. for this book. It was kind of more written for somebody who had already read a few books. Yeah. Seen. yeah. Which is interesting because uh, the way he tries to tie it back to those previous books. I mean, I brought this up in the last episode, but that chapter where you have the asterisk and it says at the bottom, yeah, see the dollars. See the dollars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see the dollars. It's like, yeah, it's available <laughs> in good bookstores near you. Yeah. But I did find it interesting that this time he doesn't seem to have the animosity towards Barbara mm -hmm. that he did mm -hmm. last time, and they yeah. do remember, you remember yeah. 
that that very first book, that's where he said she'd be prettier if she smiled more. And it's like, oh. God. Did he hoot that at her from the from the other side oh, of the street? Yeah, yes. Hey, before. baby. Yeah, exactly. Right. But he doesn't say anything like that here about Barbara. In fact, he never says anything derogatory about Barbara in this book. And I just wonder, what the hell got in Dick's bonnet about Barbara? Because he did it in Planet of the Giants. He did it in Unearthly Child. And yet here, I can't see any of that animosity. It's the weirdest thing. Well, there's not much Maybe positive. Maybe because he figured either. he would, he would um, send Susan off on her way through love. <laughs> right. I, guess, I suppose so. But there's not much personality at all. So there aren't those negative characteristics of Barbara. But there aren't really positive ones either. She just kind of acts. She doesn't have much personality. I, I will say it's kind of awesome that she drives the lorry on her own and she knows how well, to... Well, she work. also has that girl with her and uh, mm -hmm. Jenny. Like Jenny. Jenny. Yeah, he was Jenny. And, you know, the chick's like totally uh, like just pessimistic about everything oh, and she's like, I've already done this like forever <laughs> and like, come on, let's just do this and, you know, like... So, I mean, she does help the guy out in the wheelchair and she gets him to where I have to go and so, I mean, she's like a driving force. They're all driving a different force and she's driving hers with I think they were, there was a rumor that they were considering Jenny as the um, replacement companion. Yeah. I'm so glad they didn't go that route. I oh, could God. see that happening, and no. Ew. Yeah. Yeah, she was she, like... She had, like, a little bit of, like, redemption in the end. Just... But just because she cried over her own planet, it wasn't for, like... Yeah. It was herself. But, but, like, they pointed out, like, if you had lived your whole life fighting this war against yeah. these things that had invaded your... But, like, when did humans like, suck at not, like, fighting Daleks? Like, they're so easy to talk about. <laughs> like, I mean, I, well, at this point, I was yeah. going to say, the, the, yeah, there the Daleks like, that... There's a plague and then whatever, but still. The Daleks that I know, the Daleks that I'm familiar with from, like, the later series, it's like, yeah, it's this, angry. this, this is elementary Dalek. Yeah. This is like, oh my god. These are relatively easy to take down. Yeah. The later ones. And they're still giving them issues. Like, later, like, you can't even touch them. Like literally, you, cannot, you touch cannot touch them. They, it's dangerous to do it. There's so much more, and so like that in a way is kind of fun to see, like the way the dogs themselves evolve. Evolve. Yeah. Like, um, because yeah, they are like the ultimate evil. Oh, yeah. But they gave so. them respectable background, I thought, where they are not as much of a physical threat, but they are smart and they plan this multi-stage invasion where there aren't enough people close to one another to support one another to resist the Daleks, where in context it made sense. It just the sheer numbers were overwhelming. Oh, yeah. Even if they were individually not much of a threat compared to the modern ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in, in that way, in the original script, Terry Nation is kind of cleaving very closely to H.G. Uh, Wells' War of the Worlds, where the Martians come and just completely pummel the humans into submission, and then they start draining them of their bodily fluids, which the Daleks do not do. No. Yeah. At least not yet, anyway. Well, they drain them of their humanity. Yeah, there is that. There's definitely that. <laughs> Why kill the people humanity when you can use them? Yeah, right. That's true. So is this the first story where the Daleks and the Machine Men are in the same story? The Robomen? The oh, Robomen, sorry. Yeah. Um, you may be confusing them with Cybermen. I might be. Yeah, because Cybermen are much later. They're like gotcha. three years away from this story. I am ashamed and retract my remark. <laughs> Don't be ashamed. You be ashamed at all. But they do eventually meet on screen in David Tennant's first season, at which point they trash talk each other. It is the most brilliant. <laughs> I do scene. remember that now. That scene is, you can tell it's written by a <laughs> man. It's the sort of thing that two people who really hated each other got together at a bar on a Saturday night. Right. And just what would happen? Throwing shade at each other, but they both happen to be semi-robotic in nature. That well, gay men and bars and sorry, do not know. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> you know, enough about me. <laughs> Speaking of romance, terrible, terrible transition. What do we think of Susan's blossoming romance and eventual departure to be? With David Campbell. Considering that you showed me the movie where Susan is a child, it totally weirded me out and seemed completely inappropriate. <laughs> I bet it would. Yes, because we have both characters in that movie, but since she is, what, nine, mm -hmm. ten at that point, it's completely wrong for that to ever have happened. So they wrote it out of the script. 
So it weirded you out because you had previous knowledge of other things. Is she really 9 or 10, though? In, well, no. In the movie version. Oh, okay, okay. That they did with Peter Cushing. Okay. Susan and is a girl. A little girl? A little girl. Younger. Yeah, so there isn't any of this. Like, here she's like 16, house. right? Like, yeah. 16 or she's, 17. Yeah, she's a little older. Yeah, 16 going on 116. Yeah, yeah that's true. And plus, she's not even really young. She's older because right. they're already older. Possibly. I just think it's kind of like. I don't know. I think it's kind of like a cop out. It was really forced. It felt yeah. very forced. It I felt mean, it really was forced like in all actuality. But it was just like, oh, I'm gonna go on this planet and. I would I almost rather die. see her <laughs> die. I would almost rather have Susan get killed, yeah. go out big, be know, a I martyr. I, you know, you could have been at adventures and. Oh, right just, now, I'm gonna leave you on this planet. <laughs> Earth that you're kind of familiar with. Yeah. Two hundred years in the future. Which, like, dude, you don't even know. Like, the, you know with, him for, like a day or two. with a guy you don't know. Who's Scottish? After <laughs> there's nothing wrong with Scots. Hello. Um, but like of all places to leave her, like yeah. I'm gonna leave you after the dogs have pretty much destroyed the planet and Thanks you're gonna be stuck here in this like destitute planet. Yeah. Dude. And like, this isn't like 12th, 12th incarnation of the Doctor where it's like, I can go right back to that time and place. This yeah. is like the first Doctor who back. can't even get Barbara and Ian back to where they want to go. So it's not like Susan's like, the Doctor can come back if he wants. No. It's He's never coming The back. Doctor does say, one day I shall come back. Uh, actually, does he do that in the book? I don't because remember. Because he does that in the televised version. I think he does. Well, I think, I don't know if he actually says it, but... I don't think he does. He's, he does have that beautiful line about all these years I've been taking care of you and all the time yeah. you really felt you were taking care of me, which is really sweet. Yeah. But, no, he doesn't. Yeah, he didn't say anything about coming back. Yeah. In the televised version, well, this is for two reasons. One, this little behind the scenes, and I just finished Hartnell's biography, so this is you know kind of affecting once I think about it. Hartnell was so upset at Caroline Ford leaving that he flubbed a lot of his lines. He still got through the speech, but he didn't do the speech completely yeah. delivered because they were on this small set. She's up on the screen, he's talking to her, but he can see her across the studio and he's delivering the speech. About one day I shall come back. Till then there must be no tears, no regrets. Hartnell got upset because he could see that she was actually crying. Mm. And it it kind of ruined his threw him off, but you, it also makes it a much more affecting scene. At one point, he does say, "One day I should come back," and that makes the beginning of uh, the Five Doctors, the twentieth anniversary, when they do get back together. Did she quit the show, or was she fired yeah, from the show? She quit. Yeah, she eventually got to the point where she was sick of screaming and being, you know, <laughs> this helpless little girl, and she had been told. And they literally rewrote her as a little girl well, from the movie. Yeah. That's I mean, exactly it. Yeah. But they, she was told that she was being cast as this alien teenager who was going to be doing awesome things, and all she did basically was say, Grandfather, Grandfather. Like <laughs> right. Heidi. She was a damsel in distress, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, yeah. uh... And, and that's been the case with so many female companions on Doctor Who, that the ones who have left have basically said, the reason I left is because I got sick of screaming. Yeah. Many of them well, did. Well, it's like, what, the middle 60s? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the other thing. She can't... They were, like, to starting to get there, like, I'm gonna... Die. I'm about to burn a bra, you know? Oh, my God, I'm sick of screaming for Grandpa, you yeah. know? Even on Star Trek The Next Generation, Gates McFadden and Marina Sirtis talked about for the first two or three seasons, mm-hmm. like, they both had stage combat trainings but. You know, they were they always had to hit someone with a frying pan or something yes. like that was the example. And of course Denise Crosby left For because she felt like she was asked to just shake her backside, I think is what she said. She said and, she was sick of saying uh, fre- uh, hailing frequencies open. Yes. Yeah, so, basically the same problem it, that Michelle Nichols. And had. that show improved, but that was you know eighty seven through ninety that that show was written that way. Yeah. Exactly. And they covered up the cleavage. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> right. So it's obviously that's one reason why they can't kill Susan off. Because their main audience is going to be teenagers. That's going to be killing off the identifying character at that point, and the kids will be traumatized. But isn't she going away anyway? Yeah. So then yeah. who but cares? She's going off to be married. But she's going to off to be Scottish. Boy. I mean, he is Scottish still, but... 
But that's the thing. It's you, like you had a bad experience. Right, I'm sorry. I just lost to our two Scottish listeners. I'm no. sorry. Angus and uh, McLeod. Now that you've lost them. Yet. Now that you've lost them for now real. I've lost them for. Um. So. No, like I don't. I didn't want Susan to die, but it's just like having a character die when you're in <laughs> when you're in the middle of this battlefield battleground the world's taken mm-hmm. over like that would make more sense than yeah. you just got to this place and you fall in love with someone enough to leave your grandfather that you've been traveling with for so long no it's stupid it just doesn't make any sense i would like i said i would much rather have had her die Right. And it would have made more sense to have her die than to have her just run away with this man. And having just criticized that point of view, let me defend that point of view because you're right. Within the year, within season two, you're going to have not one but two companions die. Yeah. So it, you're right. It does make perfect sense. For the doctor's granddaughter to die? Yeah. It's a little bit that he was a failure then, probably. Yeah, that he couldn't protect her. As a love interest, he was what Dorothy Parker called a bit of a stuffed camisole. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. There's there's really nothing to David Campbell. But then again, I haven't. I don't. I haven't seen this episode. Just the film version where she's a little girl who doesn't run off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to be trafficked to the resistance forever, that would have worked. So oh God. I, I haven't seen the actor. I mean, maybe he was very compelling and magnetic. I don't know. Maybe no. it, maybe it played off better on screen. No. no? Okay. No, I think it's weird just because he said he loved her. You know. Yeah. He said don't like don't leave. I guess they. I mean, I guess they had some like heart to heart talks in between things like. Oh, this is my planet. I wouldn't leave it because I want to make sure everything's gonna be okay on it. And yeah. Yeah. and then she's like, "Oh, I don't come from a time, and I can't get back." And, <laughs> and why don't we make this together? And mm-hmm. that's your typical love stuff. But the thing that gets me about that is <laughs> uh, that, should be, that should be in the script. That should be <laughs> in the book. Unfortunately, you get David Campbell, who I think is one of the most judgmental sons of bitches ever because he says, well, you've never settled anywhere. You've never mm-hmm. committed to anything. It's like, like how would, the, yeah. yeah, she's done all this awesome traveling. Like, and uh, saved lives. Who is it? Jane Eyre. Sinjin, the missionary? Yeah. Who wants to take her off to die? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, oh, that's, that's what you want to do. Fine. Yeah. So I saved my grandfather on the planet of the sensorites. I did all those other yeah. awesome things, and you're going to say, oh. But I just never loved a boy, and so I'll that? never be a woman. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's... Yeah. That's, 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 just kind of like that's where it comes in. It's like, it's yeah, not good it's, enough for it's her. not good enough for her, because, yeah, if she is this... An alien... Yeah, not if she's this her. Gallifrey and we don't know if she's a Time Lord or not. We don't know if, like, what's in store for her. And it's just like... I do. <laughs> well, you do, but well, I'm just saying, like, in 1960-whatever, when it initially came out, like, the future was wide open. They didn't have to write her off to go love this stupid man. No. Like... <laughs> It's, it's wide open, the like Gallifreyan right without a clue. They could, they could have. <laughs> I mean, they could have found somebody similar looking. Who? Well, you mean as far as a companion? As far as her character. Oh, 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 gosh. I mean, yeah, the, it was the first the season, era. right? Yeah, they yeah. probably. Could I have. mean, and in fact, no one had any stake in the. When they wanted to recast Cargill, they almost thought about doing that, and I'm glad they didn't. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there eventually. We're about a year away from talking about that. However, what we can talk about is something that just flitted out of my head like the bird that it was. Oh my god. Was it about what, her yes. being a Time Lord or something? Or what happens to her? No. Oh yeah, what happens to her? It depends on if you consider the later books canon the original novels. Because in The Five Doctors, we know that she ages into her 40s, and she sees the Doctor again. That's when we see Susan again. We'll see her in 1983. Um, And she appears to have aged. According to the books that were later published, however, Susan was indeed a time lady, and indeed had not regenerated yet, and was not aging at the same rate as David Campbell, so by the time he hit his 60s, she still looked like a teenager, and she was having to make herself up and wear a fat uh, fat suit 
so that people <laughs> wouldn't start thinking it was Suspect odd. things, yeah. yeah. And it ruined their marriage because he was like, oh my god. I actually kind of love that. Yes, and that makes some sense too because that's the realistic yeah. Yeah, outcome. that's the reality. Of... It's not going to be a happy ending for either of them. Not she... this woman is too so young is... to be with him. This woman is too thin to so be with that. him. Well, that's the thing. Uh, those books aren't considered canon. The ones that say she was a time lord. Yeah, they're those are later original novels. Okay. Even though they were published by BBC Books, uh-huh. and they were published. They were actually written by a guy who will be reading novels by soon, John Peel. They're not considered as real as the televised version. In fact, for for all intents and purposes, everything in these books are not considered canon either. So what's on screen mm-hmm. is considered Is what's canonical. actually canon. Yeah. So according to <coughs> the canon, it was David Campbell that defused the Dalek bomb while the Doctor passed out yet again. Whereas <laughs> With in the, the world vapors. we prefer, yeah, <laughs> in the world we prefer, it was the Doctor who did that heroic stuff. And that's only because some of it's because some of the books were written later than the TV show. Exactly. Oh, so that's crazy. John Peel looking at the situation and saying, "What's the logical outcome of this?" The audio dramas give you another answer, which is that Susan does age and she ends up having a child, and it's the Doctor's great grandson. And spoiler alert: those of you who have not listened to the audio dramas should close your ears right now. He ends up dying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's just kind of sad, really. But yeah, so there are like three different versions. So choose your own adventure. Just leave me out of it. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand why she would have aged quickly, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes like no sense. Well, it doesn't make sense for her to age at all, really. Because if she's Gallifreyan, then they age kind of slowly. Like real anyway. slow. Like the doctor's super old, but yeah. he's not, doesn't look as old as he is. No, but he does age. As yeah, established in, 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 series. in general, right? Yeah. Do you think that it would be explained by her staying in one place as Maybe opposed like to, Earth? Possibly. you know, like the oxygen yeah. levels? Or yeah, if you're, if you're, <laughs> if we're doing Doctor Who, um, I mean, Doctor it's, Who can, it's, can it's all, it's all theoretical at this point, but I mean, the Doctor is flying around space and time. Yeah. So of course his aging would be maybe just staying on one planet is would make you older. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that Earth's environment at this point is just shot to shit. Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure it can't be very healthy for anybody, much less time. I mean, yeah, if the Daleks are mining to the core of the planet. To, like, oh yes. Back Let's to- get back to <laughs> the reason why they're doing this. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's talk about that, shall we? <laughs> What, what do you feel about the reason why the Daleks have invaded Earth in, well, it's not 2150 AD, but let's roll with that. It's, I don't... It's ridiculous. I don't... I, <laughs> why? Why? They're going to well, use the planet as a ship? Yeah. Like a Death Star? They're gonna, yeah. They're going to drive it around the universe. Yeah. Like an old Chevy. I mean, I guess it would just end up turning into, like, a bowl of... It would end up just becoming, like rock after a while because all the grass and stuff would have yeah. flown off of it. But they eventually do do that in the new series. They move the earth. Do they? Yeah, so it could be much the same reason. They would be doing it slowly? Yeah. Possibly. But then all the life would be dead. Yeah, I think that's kind of the point. That they don't care if anybody survives. Yeah. Just yeah. I just mean it. like it would just be like once you take the earth out of its like gravitational pull though it wouldn't like I mean, how, where is the steering mechanism once you... That's a good That's point. what I didn't understand about that. That is a good Well, point. and they even were saying, like, they were going to release the core itself, which is going to fuck with the gravitational... Yeah. The gravity on the Earth, how period. How control it, then? But Especially you, when, like, free humans can, like, totally dismantle everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How about you and Allison? Did you get that far? I think everyone's expectations of hard science are... <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did like Ian pretty much breaking the mouse trap, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, eh, let me just. No, you're not gonna go down that shaft. You're actually gonna fall in this shaft. Yeah. And just sit here. Okay, great. Yeah. I thought the stronger I... parts of the book were the atmosphere they established in London when they moved to the mining location. For a book setting, they lost that. Maybe it looks great on screen, but for the book, it lost a lot of the tension that they had with the different lands, with the yeah. urban landscape. It yeah. does because ruined London 
as portrayed on the page is almost better than it is on screen. He yeah. does a very good job of establishing just how deserted and ruined the city is. But you're right, once they get to the mine, it turns into a slightly different story. And the weirder thing about that slightly different story is it's not quite the story that was on screen. This is Dix doing his best to improve the story because <laughs> the doctor has a line at one point when he's explaining what the Daleks must be doing. He says, Earth has something that no other planet has. A magnetic core. <laughs> Does it now? Which led the Doctor Who discontinuity guy to say, for no other planet, read every other planet. <laughs> because because that's how planets are formed. Mm -hmm. is, yeah, yeah. That's how planets form. Yes. So that's how any kind of cosmic mass is formed. Exactly. Yeah. So he, he changed that, at least. So... This explanation on page for what the Daleks are doing is slightly different than what's in the televised version is actually slightly better than what's in the televised version, but as it seemed it seems like we're all looking at it and saying seriously. Yeah. That's what I didn't think that, that was gonna be what it was. You but know what I mean? It would be. I don't know. I thought it was gonna be like um I don't know. You know how when they were on the other planet, how they were oh, had they, they had to use the static electricity to like go around, and they could only be on metal. Right. I thought that maybe when they came to Earth, the reason why they didn't have to be on metal was something they found in the Earth. Oh. You know what I mean? Like I thought it was going to be something to that degree. Mm -hmm. Like it was something that was making them able to be going on normal land. Yes. I don't know. I thought it was something less than like. Piloting the Earth around as a no. Something, something, less, yeah, something yeah. less ridiculous than removing the Earth's core to use yeah, it as Yeah, it was a, something that I just thought it was like their, their one thing they needed to do something, you know? Yeah. Like, and that would have been interesting, except that's obviously not... Yeah. Like they were actually yeah, mining cause something. Because they, they said, oh, all of a sudden, like, now they don't have to stay on metal and they can go around. Okay, well, when, what happened? You know, right. like, where, where did they change? I mean, I understand they're probably they, adaptable, especially since later on they're even more adaptable. But they yeah. always have hardware upgrades. They always, yeah. like, they learn from yes. their mistakes. And yeah. it's like, all right, we got beat that way. Let's not, well, let's not get that again. they're the fact that they think that everybody else is stupid. Yes. Yeah. They're and, like a typical way well, too smart person. They're, yeah. e they're, <laughs> they're egotists. Yeah. They're, they met a sanctimonious jackass and decided to stay on Earth and marry him. Well, they were created <laughs> by a sancti uh, sanctimonious jackass, so that makes some sense. But there you that. go. We don't know about that, for us. They stayed for love. <laughs> but those of us who do know about that, for us. Ten it's... years down the line, we'll, we'll meet who created them, and everything will become clear. Speaking of clarification points, another thing that Dix does really well in this book is at the beginning of chapter four, he gives the doctor a lot more lines about, uh, Ian says, I don't understand this. We saw the Daleks destroyed. We were there on Scar, we saw it happen. And of course, that's the yeah. story that you and I were on the podcast for. And the doctor sh shakes his head. The devastation may not have been as complete as we imagined. The Daleks have incredible tenacity, tremendous powers of survival. There may have been other colonies on other parts of Scaro. And even there, it's like, anyway, however it happened, the Daleks have survived and they've evolved, too, because the, now they don't have to simply move around using static electricity mm -hmm. on metal, which was always kind of dumb to begin with. I mean, but... We all start somewhere. We do. We do. <laughs> But that's actually a better explanation than having the doctor... How did he put it? He says something about, um, oh, that's that's Scarrow in the far future. We're seeing them at an early stage in their evolution. It's like, that doesn't make any damn sense. No. Why would they be at the end of their timeline when you first met them? And they're weaker, and they can only move around. Yeah, that makes no sense. When here, they're able to <laughs> invade other planets. It doesn't make any damn sense. Right, let's not get into any of that confusing timeline shit until much later. Much later, much later. Just to point out other changes that Dix has made that are actual improvements that you may not have known about. If you watched the televised version, you would have had Susan falling and hurting her ankle. She does not fall unconscious. She doesn't get to see London in that brilliant panorama. Yeah, I assume that was a great shot yeah. on the series. Yeah. Not in the television, right? Oh. She just falls off a bit of uh, stuff. She just looks like a klutz. Hurts her ankle. And then the doll, uh, the doctor says something along the lines of, you deserve a jolly smacked bottom. It's like, seriously? 
Oh my god. I kind of wish I would have said that because I would have laughed on the train. <laughs> oh wow. Right? It's in the televised version. A jolly <laughs> smack bottom. Jolly smack bottom. He deserves a jolly smack bottom. It's like, and okay, Grandpa. It's obviously, weird. Exactly. <laughs> obviously, Dix thought that was pretty stupid as well because he got rid of it. Though some of the things he keeps are kind of odd. Such as, you notice again, and you two will notice this because Sheena, maybe you did notice this in Planet of the Giants, that the doctor is referred to as Susan's quote unquote grandfather. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. in air quotes. You pointed that out for the last book as well. Yeah. And it's that was also in another book, also, too. Yeah. Right? Um, I don't remember which one it was. Well, Planet of the Giants has it. But the, <coughs> it wasn't there another book? There oh, was another one we read. Yeah. yeah. Reign of Terror. Yeah. yeah. Except he does it some, uh, some of the other It wasn't a quote unquote type thing. It was no. like kind of an assumption. Like a, he like says a, Susan and her friends yeah. were referring to Ian and Barbara. Yeah. They're not his friends. Mm. Yeah. Which is just mm. equally yeah. assholery, but. Or maybe that had been something that you had brought up during another podcast was the fact that mm. there was some um, discrepancy in whether that was her actual grandfather or not. That might be it. And, and I'm in just fact, blurring the lines. Possibly. It's a, it, just, it seems like Dix has bought into this theory that Susan isn't actually his granddaughter. And that she only calls him that out of affection. Mm. Which is a later fan theory, which is, yeah, it's a subject for debate. And luckily, we don't have to have that debate for too much longer because this is her last story. <laughs> we can talk about other people. But yeah, yeah, the fact that he refers to her as yeah, Anne's grandfather in quotes is just really strange. At least he's not doing the whole thing that Ian Martyr did, referring to the doctor's alien physiology. Yeah. Because that really would have been strange. He also gives Susan more of a personality. When Susan first, the first meets Dortman, and he asks what she can do, and she says, I can eat, that's the <laughs> line in the televised version, but she goes on a little bit and actually makes fun of him to some degree. And you're like, oh, if Susan had been like this all the time, we would have liked her so much more. Yeah. As it is, we're so glad to see her go. I just think she wasn't given a chance. Like, she wasn't really fleshed out in ways she should have been. Okay, how would you have fleshed her out? I don't know, but I just would have, like... She's an alien. Given her more to do, like... Like, the doctor's super smart. Yeah. Figures everything out. Like, she should have been the same way. Maybe she should have been... A, a little bit. It, maybe a little more. Because she's younger she's, and hasn't had as many... Exactly, you know, but trials like or whatever, but either more naivete or more child genius. Yeah, or the other. Yeah, the use of like how she is. Yeah, how <laughs> she is in the first book. Yes, exactly. Because yeah. she's brilliant at some things, terrible at others. Yeah. but she turned into suddenly being terrible at yeah. everything. Yeah, like but in yeah, in the first <laughs> book she's like she's like super smart. Yeah, but then she's never super smart again. No. Yeah. Never again. And in the Dalek uh, novelization, she's super smart for a little bit because it's another writer who's basically doing the, the first story over again. What else stands out to you about this book? Resistance is useless. <laughs> Why, yes it is. Yes it is, Actually, indeed. Yeah, right yes. <laughs> Stood out for obvious reasons. Well, yes. <laughs> of course. I, I don't. I have zero follow up for that. <laughs> Just, since I'm all Star Trek Next Generation, I, are the Borg based on a combination of different Doctor Who villains? Uh, the Robo Men no. and the Machine Men as and far others. As we know, the Borg were developed. I mean, I know they're commies, but well, they have lots of similarities to the Cybermen, which we'll get to mm -hmm. later. Yeah. It's so much so that when Neil Gaiman wrote a Cyberman episode a few years ago. He made the Cybermen basically into the Borg, which everybody hated. Mm. He made yeah, them into a collective, and people were like, that's Star Trek. That's mm. not yeah. Doctor Who. Okay. That's yeah. not what we're going for. But the Cyber, oh, I'm sorry, the Borg do end up assimilating other races, and the Cybermen end up doing that too. Mm -hmm. the Daleks, not so much, except mm. later on, the Daleks will use humans to create uh, more numbers. You get human Dalek hybrids. And then they get really weird ones, which are just pathetic and awful. But yeah, yeah, not so much. The Daleks, at this point, are very much their own thing. And they're a pretty brilliant thing. In fact, even Dick seems to think that, because uh, by now, by the time he's written this book, 
He's written a few other Dalek books already. He has novelized the Pertwee stories because that's the doctor that he was the script editor for. And at one point in chapter three, he says, he characterizes the Dalek's speech in some kind of brilliant way. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Chapter three, he says something about them being not exactly the best conversationalists or something like that, that even the Daleks. Oh, there it is. It's at the bottom of page 32. It's when the, do uh, the doctor actually, uh, when he says, you know, when they say resistance is useless, you will obey us or die. And the doctor says, die? And who are you to condemn us to death? Hmm? That settles it. Whatever you're up to, I shall pit myself against you and defeat you. The doctor's words seem to touch off one of those typical speeches, a mixture of threats and boasts, which seem to be the Dalek's only form of communication with other species. <laughs> Yeah. And I love it when he does that. It's like, <laughs> yeah, he's written enough of those at this point. It's like, we have heard many other speeches, many such speeches from the human leaders. <laughs> All have been destroyed. Resistance is useless. It must cease immediately. Oh, must it? Sure, you surely don't expect the people of Earth to welcome you with open arms. Even Daleks can't be that stupid. I love that. He does <laughs> not say that on screen. That is just Dick's having a ball with it. Yeah. He's absolutely going in Terry Nation's kind of uh, script and punching it up as best he can. Are we supposed to like this doctor? Well, you come to. You come to like him after a while. You, you, if you don't like him, you at least respect him. He's prickly, but he's likable. Yeah. But I guess I'm wondering how much we're losing in the book of whatever on screen personality there was, because he's. Almost the antagonist, the social antagonist, and not the plot antagonist in the interactions in the two books that I've oh, read. No. Yeah, oh. first doctor, that's right, because you've only really read Dick's interpretation of him, and Dick plays up the prickly parts. Except those prickly parts are there to be played up. The Hardnell Doctor is extremely irascible, very irritable, a bit of a charmer, but unless you're seeing the twinkle in Hartnell's eye on screen, that really yeah. doesn't carry across on the page too well. No. Which is unfortunate, because having read that biography of Hartnell now, I'm like, yeah, he gets kind of a short shrift on the printed page, and there have only been a few authors that have really done him justice, such as uh, Ian Martyr mm -hmm. did a very good job of him, I thought. Yeah, you could, I mean, you get a, a little bit of that, but mm -hmm. you get a sense of his humor, but it's maybe a little more mean-spirited than it's intended to come across. Yeah, it's, no, no it's meant to be that mean-spirited. <laughs> he, he actually is that mean. He really does think people are stupid. Yeah. You know, and he, that comes across very well. <laughs> yeah, and he's absolutely right. Everybody in the room is stupider than he is, except when he But it's rude it to bring it up so often. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like when, in Reign of Terror, he gets caught out not once but twice, and it's like, oh, Doctor, really? At this point, though, he's settling into the characterization of the Doctor that has come to be the case, which is almost omniscient, almost constantly um, cannot do any wrong, and when he does do something wrong, it's still the right thing. Hmm. It yeah, still works out in the end. Book. Yeah. Which is, that was this book in a nutshell. Which is a little annoying. And that's probably why um, he let Susan go with her male companion, was because he was like, oh yeah, the doctor, you're totally right about everything. You're the genius. You're the greatest. <laughs> yeah, he does like David. Yeah. He's like, okay, I can <laughs> do... He boasted up his... Loves a seek offend. Yeah. 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 Do worse for some yeah. laws. <laughs> I could have Ian, for instance. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In chapters 6 and 7, Susan refers to the doctor not once but twice as the doctor, which is just the strangest thing. Mm. And that, I think that's probably something that just gives me, makes me nuts about this book. And not in a good way. What does what does give me joy way though is how well Dix treats Barbara. He gives her a lot of internal thoughts, such as uh, her room thoughts about the Daleks finally solving London's traffic problem. Yes, yes. yes. very good. Ah, it's like finally, sort of black humor that Dix likes to engage yes. in. And that tip, that bit about the typically British response to a crisis being to make a cup of tea. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That's, I like that though because yeah. like. That whole scene, it really like broke it down. It was like, okay, well, if you need to think about something, why work yourself up and get like crazy? 
I'm just gonna make some tea and sit down and center yeah. and focus and really like yeah. yeah. So it was very. I liked that. I liked that scene. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And just pause. Yeah, and I love the idea of Barbara being the sort of gal who's able to fix her own car. Yeah. It's just like, okay, not, I mean, that would be, that would be great now, but in 1964, that's kind of amazing. Unheard of. Yeah, and I really don't know why he goes off her so completely later on. It's just kind of ridiculous. What do we think of the secondary characters? Um, people like Jenny, Dortmund. Um, and the other guy who I'm forgetting. Well, there was Tyler, there was Tyler. David, there was a couple of other... Uh, Phil. Red shirts, oh, if you yeah. want to call them that, oh, Star Trek term, but... <laughs> <laughs> but still, just like... The cannon fodder. Yeah. The cannon fodder. Yeah. All right, I just need you to die so that the main there characters can live. Oh, God. There was a lot of deaths in this Yeah, book. the death count in this book is ridiculous. Yeah. It's so high. Anybody who did anything just died. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it was all to keep yeah. the main characters yeah. alive. It was it was always like, yeah, okay, well. Yeah. Well, I already talked about Jenny here. She was, like, just yeah. a buzzkill. Um, well, like, she was run down. Um, Tyler was kind of like... I like that one guy who was like, I'm going to go out. I forgot his name, though. Don't He's like, me. I'm going to go off on my own. No, not that guy with no. the bomb. The guy who was like, he, he brought the doctor back to the area after he was on the ship. Okay. I don't know why I liked him, but he brought the doctor back to the underground area, and then he's like, I'm going to go off on my own and go out to, you know, out to the country. Sure. Yeah. And then he walks outside and he dies. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know. I was like, like oh, this guy's so kind of cool. Like, he's a lone, yeah. like, ranger. And then, like, yeah. he goes out and, and dies. dies. Yeah. Hmm. I can't remember which character that was. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it was in that scene with the, the slither. Oh, yeah, we got to talk about the slither. Mm. The slither. The yeah. The slither. Oh, my God. Did that you know the one slithers? It's Slithers. It's Slithers. <laughs> Hence the name. Jeez. It was like an octopus. The build up to it wasn't Something. bad when they're wondering what it is. That that wasn't bad, but yeah, no. It wasn't really. And that, then they like, find out. It wasn't really that like. I don't know. It was. I thought it was gonna be a snake. No. But it wasn't. No, it's 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 worse. It's like an octopus. Or What's something. hilarious about the Slither though is that Dix actually gives it its own internal thought process. That's such a Dixian thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and you did that in the At first... least used literary adjective. That's yes. very Dixian. It's very Dixian. <laughs> it's not Dickensian. No, it's very Dixian. Dixian. In fact, he did that in the very first novelization too. Because remember when the tiger attacks um, the, the caveman in the first yeah, book? Yeah, and then through the go, eyes of the tiger. Oh <laughs> yeah, through the eye of the tiger. It's the middle of fight. Uh, yeah, uh, let me see if I can do a quick image search for the slither. Except it's going to try to say Slytherin, and that's not what yeah, we're looking for. Yeah, that would not be it. Because if you do an image search for the slither, then you get <laughs> this thing. In all its glory, in fact, there is a publicity shot of it reading the uh, the Dalek book from the 1960s. Oh, the that's in a, in so a much sadder story. than I was imagining. Oh yeah, well of course it's on a it's on a budget. Yeah. But even that looks like a sad Easter Bunny costume yeah, that's, that's been like run yeah. through a Cthulhu oh, yeah. like. Yeah, let me see if I can. It's like kind of a goth shot. velveteen it rabbit. It, it's got those eyes on the bottom, and then it has the. The oh, I guess on the that. Side. That's a better shot. Yeah, in fact, for certain sure. values of better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mine probably. <laughs> it's which way is up? I was gonna say in my brain it was most of this kind of just like amorphous like goo mass, yeah. just like yeah. The sounds that it makes. Oh, that's that's probably the best shot. The sounds that it makes. Mm. Yeah. That's not bad. <laughs> the sounds that it makes are pretty terrifying on screen. I don't know how those eyeballs work with any sort of monster, though. You can just <coughs> literally chop one of them off. You really could. Done. And it would be better. Yeah. yeah. It would be a better monster all around. It would be better for it. It would be better for you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I assume that it's probably from Scaro, because we know Scaro has plenty of mutations on it because of their, you know, of their war, their protonic war, whatever it was. I do like this artist's interpretation of this. Oh, yes. I love Much that. better. That wasn't. Sarah wasn't the same thing. Much better. No, that's that's um that was, Marinus. That was Marinus. Yeah. But it wouldn't surprise me. I'm sure Scaro has an acid sea somewhere. Probably, yeah. Because it's really kinda of awful. There is one nice bit, uh, another big change. 
Phil, who's looking for his brother who's been robotized. Oh, yeah. Dies without ever recognizing... And, well, Phil's the brother who was been robotized. Uh, he dies without ever recognizing him, whereas in the televised version they fight. Phil kills him at the same time as he's killed, leading to Phil knowing him at the moment of death. And Dix probably thought that was way too much. The movie did away with it, too, because they, they struggle and fight and fall down a shaft. Hmm. So it's like, yeah, that's a little too smarmy, I guess. A little too, yeah, cutesy. I found his name. It was Baker. Baker. Baker, that's right, because he leads him to the... Shack. Yeah, he's the guy who takes him out. That's right, and then he gets taken out. Yeah, immediately. You know, there, are lots of, there are lots of just bizarre little minor characters. Like that, that was a weird like. thing, too, though, was also when that bomb was going to go off. Um... And they had all that time to dismantle it, but then they couldn't just, like, throw it somewhere yeah. else. Well, it's a big bomb. Oh. Yeah, it's about the size oh. of this table. Okay. Yeah, so there was... So that. they would have had to have done that. Mm -hmm. When you see it on yeah, screen... I wasn't, imagining a I wasn't imagining a big bomb. I was imagining, oh, like, yeah. a thing like this. Yeah. Like, it's no, pretty it's large. sitting there. But, uh, yeah, but it's a good thing that, they, that he gives all that action back to uh, the doctor to do. Because when David mm -hmm. does, it's like... Well, I guess this is what's going to win Susan over because she knows she's not going to be marrying some drunken idiot Scotsman. <laughs> He's actually a drunken, smart Scotsman. Right. I'm sorry. That's a terrible thing to say. I apologize again, Angus and McLeod. <laughs> that was a terrible thing to do. Babs, however, again, pretty marvelous. She comes up with the Robo Men um, disguise. She that historic mismatch that she does in chapter twelve is still fun, even though her referring to Red Indians is still kind of weird. Yeah. Because you yeah. kind of expect a school teacher in nineteen sixty four to do that, even yeah. a history teacher. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was in the eighties they did that. Yeah. Sort of. And it's still 1977, so Once again, your expectations are far too high. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just wanting, you know, a version of this story that's got some modern sensibilities, and this book is not going to provide that. Dortman, <clears throat> the guy in the wheelchair. On screen, he comes across as just incredibly defensive, as the sort of, you know, person that you would describe as handy capable. Because that's the name, the word that he would use for himself. It's like, ah, I'm not handicapped, I'm handicapable. Look at me, look at me blow myself up with this bomb to prove to you that these bombs work. <laughs> is, is he any better on the page? Very inefficient quality control process. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> what do we think of him on the page? I think it's kind of the same. I mean, yeah. he's kind of like obsessed with this bomb, though, but that's probably because he can't like get out there and like physically do things. But he's still trying to do something for the cause, which is... You know, good. I think he's pretty off-putting, but like he he had that one inner interchange with Susan where she like pushed back against him, yes. and he was like, "Oh." He actually laughs. So I feel like even though he is this kind of like stern like character where he is in control mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, he he does like see when people have merit. Yeah, he he is at least like I'm not infallible i'm not all-knowing i am better than a lot of you guys but like every other person on the earth resistance i thought they were all completely yeah. interchangeable and oh, yeah. remarkable and i didn't even bother to distinguish them after about 10 pages okay yeah and yet dix has given them a little more uh depth than they have on screen which is something that i find that dix does well when he tries i thought that of the previous book Really? Having not seen any of the actors or performances, I thought that the guest characters were actually a little more interesting than the regular cast. Right. And this time I thought it was the opposite. Okay. I thought the previous book was it Planet... It's not called Planet of the Dicks. Um, Planet of the Giants. Planet of the Giant Dicks. Planet of the Giants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the atmospherics were kind of fine, but the guest stars were kind of entertaining, and here I thought it was the opposite. I thought it started off with terrific atmospherics, and then we just had all these people doing, interchangeable people doing interchangeable things, yeah. and sort of opposite strengths. And I could see that. Yeah. I mean, even David Campbell isn't given, that's one thing that Dix could have done. He could have made us fall in love with him the same way that yeah. Susan does. That's and, yeah. You're right about that. Yeah, there's just nothing nothing there that seems to that, appear. like pops out. Maybe he didn't Why? like the story. Um, Maybe he had contempt for it and he couldn't change it. 
he changed enough of it though. Yeah. Yeah. He changed enough of it. And he makes the um, the ending with the doctor's speech to Susan when he leaves actually a lot more affecting oh mm. no, that's not quite true. It's really affecting on screen. It's affecting on the page too. That's one part of this book that I think is really quite lovely. One of your talking points, I'm just I have I have your notes. Uh, right. um, one of the things you you brought up and I thought too was how did the Daleks not realize the Doctor is not human? Yeah, yeah, because they ran those tests. They're going to robotize him, and it's like, how do you not realize that his anatomy is not the same as yeah. everyone else you've been yeah, dealing with? Yeah, and for that matter, how do the Daleks test any of the other, the other humans with that weird test with the key? when you'd have to know something about the Daleks themselves to know that they would need yeah. that key. Yeah. Yeah, the test itself. Like, I mean, the, the test itself was. wasn't... Yeah, like, not... These humans that have been run down for ten years, yeah. I don't think they're gonna, like, really... But they might know something more about the Daleks at this point. I mean, That maybe. makes more sense, actually. Thank you. Because that actually does make sense. If they've been under the doll, like, But then the know. guy that was in the cell with them, he was like, oh, what are you doing? This is stupid. We're just all going to die. Yeah, but he's an idiot. Yeah, true. And he ends up getting robotized anyway. True. Which is weird. I want to because get... I thought they wanted only like smart people to be robotized. At some point, do they just say, like, we'll just take anybody? Or well, I think what why happened... do they want the doctor? I think what happens there, and Dix doesn't do this in the book, but this is my long-standing theory on that is that the Daleks robotize anybody of sufficient intelligence because they don't want those people to end mm. up fighting against them. That makes yeah. sense. So they instead make them subservient, which leads to that horrific suicide scene yeah. at the very beginning of the book, which is pretty grim on screen, too. Even though it's bookended by a Dalek coming up out of the Thames <laughs> for no apparent reason, just swimming around. around. It comes it's just was enjoying the day. Yeah, it's just how it ends. I mean, the creature, creature inside. inside. No one else is yeah, enjoying it. Hey, it's splashing it's around. Cool. It's yeah. a little slimy guy. I, I think it's probably because the water quality on Scar was such that probably yeah. the Thames is a step up. Like exactly. It's like, yay, but did it really need to be in the water? It, it gets worse because <laughs> in the next story, a doll like pushes itself up out of the sand. Huh? Yeah, it's stupid. What was it doing in there? Flair for the melodramatic. Yeah. Like, entrance. Really awful. But you're right. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, just... Yeah. I think I was just happy that they got rid of the Daleks saying to the Robomen, take off his coat! And it's like, oh my god, why would a Dalek know what a coat is? (laughs) Yeah. Right. And Dix takes that out. He improves it. This is Except taking the doctor's coat off. He needs it. Yeah, exactly. How are they going to know he's a doctor if he's not wearing a coat? (laughs) Come on. All right, so any last thoughts? Any lines you thought were great? Any scenes you thought Um, were great? Anything that was great? Anything bad? Anything that you looked at and just said, oh my god? I thought the part, um, I know it was just too, um, I like the the book in whole, but, um, the one part that I thought was, like, super unnecessary other than to drive the, um, the story itself was the part with the two ladies in the forest. Ah. Like, I was like, what is the point of that? Mm-hmm. You know, can I make oh, sure that we they... know they're ugly or something? Yeah, no, like, just like, okay, yeah, we gotta get them over there. You know what I mean? It was like yeah. one of those, like, parts of the book where I was just like, yeah, I know they gotta get there. There's a weird we focus on like, bad them. meals also. Yeah. Like, well, eating tinned food. Like, oh, they have to stop and have another bad meal. Yeah. <laughs> Terry Nation has always said that the Nazi, uh, I'm sorry, that the Daleks were his men. The Nazis. The Nazis. Yeah. yeah. And that those two would basically be sympathizers. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So that makes sense. Or even if, even if not sympathizers, definitely people looking out for their own necks well, as opposed well, to the rest of their... Well, definitely looking out for their own yeah. necks, for sure. Yeah. You know. As you would be an, yeah. under an occupying force. Right. It was just kind of like, to me, I mean, I, I, I was like, in a way, sort of cool, because they were like, oh, it looks like a gingerbread house, and they're like, living <laughs> in like, 14th century England, and but it's not. Yeah, it's and actually the 22nd just, yeah, century. Yeah, and I'm like, and what is the, going on? But, well, yeah. something that Chino will find interesting, I maybe. Um, you remember the old mother from the very first story? You know, you will not make fire. Yeah. Uh, woman. The actress who played her uh-huh. plays the old woman in the cottage, ah. but in the movie version, mm. huh. which you've seen, Alice. So don't mm. even left out of this. I apologize. It's okay. Maybe next time you should finish I it. haven't overacted. I did finish it. <laughs> she did. I did finish the book. <laughs> 
<laughs> I finished it five minutes before we started recording, I just but I they would did do finish it. To those women, like once the dog, now the dogs are gone. Like, will oh. they become like? They'll probably be killed. Yeah. As right. Sympathizers. Yeah. That's what you get. As collaborators. You should care more about grinding misery and so many deaths than. I do not think the author succeeded in making us care about all these no. characters and their deaths. No. And yet, it's still somewhat better than the televised version. <laughs> they always say the book is better than the TV. So exactly. Like, even though this book is based on the TV episode, like, he made yeah. it. Well, that's as good a transition as any. Yeah. As we always do, let's go to goodreads.com for online reviews of the book written by other readers, then follow up with our own ratings. By the way, if you're listening to this podcast and want to have your own review featured when we get to an upcoming book, simply read the book, write a review on Goodreads, and then write a comment somewhere so that we have a chance to see it before discussing the book ourselves. You may just get your review read out loud here. The average rating for this story on Goodreads out of five stars is 3.7. Here are some sample reviews. Michael, who gives it two stars, says this. One of the most memorable First Doctor stories gets a fairly standard adaptation for the printed page. Part of that is the fact that the six-part William Hartnell story has some stunning visuals of Daleks gliding through the streets of a deserted, invaded future London, which is true. It's stunning. It's beautiful. And part of that is that Terence Dick struggles to compress a six-part story to the 128-page count. Actually, it's not 128 pages, it's longer than that, thank you. <laughs> Mandated by Target Books at the time it was published. This retelling of the story combines elements from the television and movie version. That's almost true. This is one of the Hartnell stories adapted in what I call the middle period of the Target novels, when they didn't so much enhance or deepen what we saw on screen, but merely compress the events onto the printed page without any flourishes or additions. Dix does manage to make the slither a lot more sinister than it appears on screen, but the rest of the novel is, unfortunately, a rather bland experience. Sean LeBeau, however, gives it the full four stars. Four stars. Yes, and says this is the story where we lose Susan as a main character. Yeah. And the growing distance between Susan and the Doctor is presaged at the beginning of the book, which suggests, suggests that even though she calls him grandfather, he may not be. That's an interesting way of looking mm -hmm. at it. And throughout, where Susan mostly refers to him as the Doctor. Oh, he's actually tried to explain that. There's a slight suggestion of a romance between Barbara and Ian here. Well, obviously. The best part of the story is that the Doctor is portrayed as intelligent, resourceful, and clever instead of the tottering old man we get for Hartnell's Doctor. This is probably Terence Dick's best novelization. And even though it's based on the original serial and not the 60s movie starring Peter Cushing, it has all the drama and tight screenplay of a feature. In fact, more so than the underwhelming movie itself had. Hmm. That's interesting. Hmm. And finally... Jenny Rigg gives it the full five stars. But she says, this is my first <laughs> She ever. is very drunk. But she <laughs> might be, as I'm getting close <laughs> This to is you. my first book I've ever read. She actually said this. This is my first ever Doctor Who book, when I was eight. And therefore, I cannot view it with any kind of objectivity. No, fair enough. I read it and read it, reread it obsessively. This was in the days before video recorders, never mind the ubiquitous doc classic Who these days, so Target paperbacks were the only way to get your fix between series. Picking this book up again flooded me with warm, happy feelings. Terence, as I call him, has a characteristic tone and style which is like a comfort blanket to me. I'm sure there are many flaws in this book. Other people who have reviewed it certainly seem to think so, but they're wrong, of course. <laughs> but I'm utterly incapable of seeing them. You blind, blind child, you. All right, so let's uh, let's get your star rating and let's do it. Uh, I always go point. first. Yes. No, let's me oh, go first. Okay. I had to last time. Okay, well, don't <laughs> you go first. Oh, you want me to start first? <laughs> out, of five, so uh, out of five, I'm okay. Three point seven five. Okay, one. Well, go close to wildly four. generous. I'm generous. I'm usually pretty generous yeah. with these things, but. I wasn't last week, Sheena. You'd be happy I gave that book a two. I usually... Uh, oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that I... Um, this one over here gave it a 1.5. No, I, I like this book, though. I, it I, was higher than I expected. I think it's... Um, I thought that it was it was entertaining. I thought that it gave me... Uh, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was funny. I thought that it was funny. I thought that it was entertaining. I thought that it kept me interested. I liked that I got to see the old Barbara come back a little bit. I got to see the old Ian come back a little bit. I got to see Ian go away. 
I like Susan. Yeah, Susan, sorry. Um Yeah, I I enjoyed it. I feel like it's not perfect, it's not hundred percent, it's not the greatest thing I've ever read, but it was enjoyable. It um it definitely was nice to see the Daleks, so it was uh it was good to I, I didn't read the the first uh, Dalek book with you guys, so I have to go back and read that. You really do. But having having seen like the newer series and seeing where the Daleks go to and what they become, seeing seeing this version of the Daleks was interesting and, and really seeing like, okay, well, they're still getting to where they're going. But yeah, it was enjoyable. It was interesting to really see that. Okay. Um, Come out on the page, so. So 3.75. Yeah, 3.75. Allison, how about you? Planet of the Giant Dicks, I had extremely low expectations. The first paragraph was the worst one in the entire book, and so I was pleasantly surprised. This one I had higher expectations. The first paragraph was the best, and then it, I thought it went downhill after the first few pages. So I'd go 1.75. Ooh. Yeah, that's higher than the previous wow. one. <laughs> you told me that we were comparing this... To all the freaking published literature, okay? Wow. That's still good. You are a savage today. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know. Who let the dogs out? out? Yes, uh, yes. In general. Yeah. Everybody needs a hobby. But 1.75. That's higher than the previous one. But why? Uh, because I um, thought it started off strongly and then it disappointed me. And then me. it disappointed me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. Sheena? Um, I think with the, um, the first... <laughs> Dalek's book that I've read, I think I gave it like eh, threes, probably. Yeah, you I think I gave like 3.5. Um, I would go like 3.7, 3.75 also. Um, I thought the book was a really easy read. Um, it's what I like to read about when it comes to Doctor Who books. Um, I had a good time. I was on the train reading it. It went by fast. Um, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, for me, like, a, these books that are in comparison to each other, some of them are extremely hard to, like, get through, and everything's like, oh, my God, like, yeah. I just got to, like, keep my eyes on the page. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and that was that was the um, the last one well, that we did together. The oh, one. yeah. Reign of Terror. Reign of yeah. Terror. For me, it was just like, oh, my God, like, I'm, like, staring at it like this, <laughs> and, like... That was yeah. the longest one we've yeah. read. Yeah, yeah. And, it Two, was, though, and it was so. and it was just like, oh god! But this one for me, not the longest I, one she's read. Though. No. Yeah, no. But um, it's just this book was nice. It was what I wanted to read in a Doctor Who book. It was sci-fi. It was action. There was death. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Susan's gone. Yay. Yes. Um, I mean, for a dumb reason. Um, but I, in all in all, I thought it was a, a, a good Doctor Who book. Yeah. I mean, if you were to be reading your first Doctor Who book, I'd probably read the first Daleks book, and then I'd read this one. Okay. I wouldn't, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. to me, the history ones, I, I just, yeah. Yeah, I can't stand them. Well, That's, don't worry. I, <laughs> I'm the, I like the sci-fi well, stuff. Well, so. we're two books away from another history one, but it's a fun one. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be, there's got to be one where I'm going to be like, oh, this is awesome. You but will love the I love the sci-fi I'm ones. sure you will love the Romans. As for myself, I'm going to scandalize everybody, probably Allison most of all, because I'm going to give this one a four out of five. And for, but for different reasons. Um, I can find my own way home. Yeah. <laughs> you talked about expectations last time, yeah. and my expectations were to be completely exhausted by this book because we you just already read it. Yeah, yeah, well, that and we come out of Planet of Giants, yeah. and that was just abysmal. That was a sort of slog for me. Yeah. The Reign of Terror was for you. Okay. I hated it, and it was short. Yeah. And it was short. It was. It was a long. Yeah, like I think I like I literally think I read like I thought I read like I think I read like half. Yeah. Whereas this book, the plane. this book, I, I had just seen the televised version, and I was like, okay, I'm all right with the televised version, but I like the movie better. Let me go ahead and read this. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is actually, t in some ways, better than the movie mm -hmm. version. And it improves on certain things that I've always hated about the television version. Uh, gives the Hartnell Doctor more to do, because obviously Hartnell hurt his back, poor thing, and had to take that week off. And Dix has those nice little touches. We get into the Slither's head for a second. Um, we have that black humor on Barbara's part. Um, there are a few other 
characterization touches in it that are nice. And having read so many other Dick's novelizations and knowing what's coming, I look at this one and say, okay. It's like that meme of the dog in hell having a cup of coffee and saying, this is fine. fine. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite that. It's not quite that. But I'm, that's how I feel about the televised version. Whereas this book, I'm like, okay, this is, this is better. This I like. So four out of five. Willing to do it. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and have... In reading a lot of Doctor Who books so far, it's kind of like you already know how things are going to go. Yeah. Just because of what kind of story it is. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. just how is it going to go about. Right. And you know, a, and like, what yeah. are you going to get out of it that's different than any other story? Right. And I, yeah. I suspect that for all three of you, since this story is new to you, it's one of those instances where you're looking at it and saying, okay, I'm judging it just based on what I'm seeing here. And I've got that kind of You've got a movie and a TV show and... I've got four different and like, Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. And yeah. It's like, but okay. Do people like us actually exist in nature? People who read Doctor Who novels but haven't actually seen the episodes? I, I would really like are, to... Are we completely I don't, I have, an artificial construction barely, of Tony Witt is what I want to know. I, I barely watch, I've watched some new Doctor Who, but I've never watched any old, barely. And we still need to do that sometime yeah. this summer. Yeah. I've only ever seen... A handful of old episodes, most and of I don't remember that, most like, of them. You say though, is that the books are better though? So to some degree, many yeah. of them are. And some we of could them just are dress up worse. like we're in the sixties and have like a. <laughs> Well, that would be fun. A swirly. Is it going right. to be the up this summer? Because we could probably do it as a party. Yeah, we should. <laughs> Get a black and white TV. Yeah, <laughs> we could just, yeah. But Allison's, Allison's question is well taken, because I think most people who read these books will have seen the televised version, or they'll be fans of the show, and therefore they'll be invested in reading it. But you're right. There are very few people that just come to the books to say, oh, Doctor Who, this is a new fandom. I think I'll try this out. But I'm sure there, there must be some. I know on Goodreads, occasionally yeah. you'll say, have somebody say, I just came mm -hmm. upon this book at random, mm -hmm. but I haven't yet to see one of those. It may be but the most organic type of Doctor Who fan, really. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if you think about it, like, if when you, like, for, say, like, the Harry Potter series, like, yeah. most of the people read the books when it first came out, but then they watched the movie. But yeah. now you get the people who saw the yeah. movies first and then read the books. And the, again, so there's no the basis to comparison. My students, many of yeah. them, have only seen the movies. Yeah. And have never read the books. Yeah. So it's kind of like we're learning this like organically in a sense that we don't have any basis of comparison, sort of. Exactly. Yeah. I've always been more the type that seeing a televised or movie version of something makes me invested to go back and read. Really? So I tried to read the first Harry Potter book before the movies came out yeah. and could not get into it. Mm -hmm. I watched the movie and said, oh, those first couple yeah, of chapters suck. <laughs> if I can get through that, I'm yeah. set. I'm the opposite. And a lot of that goes, a lot of that comes into play here too. Like not having watched a lot of the early Doctor yeah. Who stuff. Now having, you want to watch it. But I want to watch it. But having seen everything from the revival in 2005. Right. 2000, is that right? 2005. Yeah. So ha see, having seen everything since then, I'm at least familiar enough with the yeah. world yeah. to I be mean, like, okay, you can well. You pick it out of where it's from. Yeah. yeah. Whereas I'm betting in Alcon's case, you said last time you hate adaptations. I hate screen to page adaptations, yes. Okay. So if you had seen the, Yeah. The it's a mental story. block, it's a psychological weakness. Um, I loved as a kid the animated version of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe oh. and The Chronicles of Narnia was yes. my favorite childhood yes, series. Yes, and I yes. could never read the first book mm -hmm. because I'd seen that movie first. And, the, and then it's just yeah. like you're just yeah. re seeing the movie in your head. Whereas I think I mentioned before yeah. that my husband talks about he would read the Star Trek novels to replay the episode in his head because he couldn't just pop it in the VCR. They didn't have a VCR yet. That wasn't yet available. So sort of an opposite phenomenon. I wonder here if I'm missing a lot of the episode by not, a lot of the book by not being able to replay the visuals in my head or That's the characters. Thing. Novelizations, if they're working well, you shouldn't have to. Yeah. You really yeah. shouldn't. And Dix is to get back to our you know double dicking of the month. <laughs> Dix is one of those authors who tries very <laughs> deliberately to recreate the televised version yeah. on the page. That's one of his blessings, but that's also one of his limitations. He doesn't go further into it, so you're not actually missing a lot, but there's a lot on screen that you may be missing. It, yeah, six of one half dozen of another. 
Depends on the story. I'd, I'd argue that this is one of those stories that you're probably better off having read it. Yeah. Because you've seen the movie version. Yes. Yeah. But the brain did not retain much of it. No. The brain did not retain. <laughs> the great windshield wiper yes. wiped it away. As always, thank you guys. And thank you, fellow time travelers, for giving us your valuable time. Next time, we get back to Ian Martyr and his rather unusual novelization of the two-part adventure, The Rescue. Hmm. In the meantime, if you've liked what you've heard here, like us on Facebook at Doctor Who Target Book Club Podcast, all one word with no spaces. You can also visit our subreddit at reddit.com forward slash r forward slash dwtargetbc. If you add a comment on Facebook, or on our subreddit, or even on SoundCloud, or on one of our other podcast platforms, if you think there's something we missed here, or you just want to tell us you like us in words, you'll be entered in our next Target book giveaway. This time, some lucky fan randomly picked by me will get a gently used copy of Doctor Who and the War Games. Yes, it is the same copy. Maybe it's just that no one wants this book? If you want a different book, comment! Let me know what book you want goodness i'll do it also feel free to watch our videos and give us a thumbs up or comment on youtube we're at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash emperor dalek all one word follow forward slash videos follow us on twitter we're at dwtargetbc or subscribe to us via the podcast provider of your choice we are on itunes soundcloud stitcher TuneIn, and intermittently on podbean if all else fails you, email us at dwtargetbc at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening, and enjoy your travels. Bye-bye. <laughs>